friends, uh, so in this uh, Dhamma talk I want to continue the discussion about the topic of living and dying with awareness. Now, I think I've already mentioned uh, living and dying uh, in the Dhamma language uh, there's two levels to that. And actually, actually, in the Dhamma language, there's two levels to almost everything that's mentioned in the Dhamma, the external level and the internal uh, level. And uh, we mentioned yesterday, the external level of living and dying is, you know, you see a baby born, you see it, uh, you know, grow up or a person, uh, and then die at some point uh, in their life, you know, the physical body. So that's what we would call conventional uh, birth and death of the body. But then there's also, according to the Dhamma, the birth and death of the mental process, the birth and death of impermanence that, uh, you know, the, the various sensations and stimulations are coming through the, the senses and also then the consciousness that arises and passes away. Of course, that level of birth and death can really only be understood by uh, through meditation because it's, you have to kind of like be looking through a microscope uh, to see that, and not a not a, a physical uh, microscope, a biological scientist microscope, but the microscope of concentration and mindfulness, mindfulness and concentration and wisdom. Anyway, so uh, but you know, even with the conventional uh, life. Uh, I mean, we call it conventional because, you know, that's all the average person knows about. But from the Dhamma point of view, <laughs> the, the life of the mind is more important than this physical life. So that's why, you know, when you talk Dhamma, it's like totally radically different uh, in many regards to the ordinary conversations that uh, people have. You know, about generally about the world and so on. Uh, but we talked about yesterday about how, you know, even in the regular life, the life of a person grows up, they're accumulating karma every, every uh, minute and every hour, day, week, and year of their life, they're accumulating. Uh, Kama, that means the results of their actions and creating habits. So even a child growing up, they learn in the language where they were born, right? So that becomes a habit, you know, and then they speak only this one particular language uh, that they were growing up in. That's because they kept on repeating it hundreds and thousands of uh, times uh, over again. And other mannerisms that they might see people doing, every culture has their own mannerisms and uh, sometimes they're diametrically opposite than the other uh, types of uh, cultures. And then we tend to, you know, 
base our judgment. Oh, they're uncouth because they clean their backside with their fingers or their hand instead of using toilet paper, for example. Or, you know, they eat with their fingers. How uncouth, you know, and have to eat with a proper fork and spoon. And, uh, anyway, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I'm just giving some examples. Huh? Uh, so, but, you know, our mind gets conditioned to, uh, you know, thinking one way or another is uh, better than other ways. But anyway, all these are, you know, conventional truths, but we're creating karma a whole life uh, that we have to reap the results. And as I mentioned, if you uh, live unmindfully, then that, you know, unmindfulness is the path to death. Uh, and if we're not watching our mind, we can prematurely cause death to this body by so many uh, uh, different ways, deliberately or accidentally or even by other sort of ways. Uh, and then death. And, you know, most people are afraid of death. And uh, when people get old, they start worrying about, you know, they're going to get old, who's going to take care of me, and then they get the diseases, and then the, uh, uh, you know, they can't do what they used to do, and they, it affects their mind, and, and then also death is seen as something uh, bad, or, you know, death is seen as something to be uh, feared in many cases. And the poor doctors in the hospital, right? The doctors in the hospital are trying to save lives, but people are going to die anyway. And, uh, you know, in fact, that's the only thing certain in life is death. Life is not certain because, as we mentioned yesterday, babies don't even get out of the womb sometimes. Or they don't last more than a day or two and they might die in every increment of time. So... And not knowing in advance that that would happen even. So life is uncertain. But the only thing that's definitely certain is uh, death. And when you are born, you have a one-way ticket to the graveyard or the crematorium. And so that's the only thing, uh, you know, certain. So why do people think it's so unusual? Of course, death is caused by karma too. Whether you live out your lifespan, if you have relatively good karma, you live out the lifespan even longer. Like I said, my mother lived to 102. There's people who live longer than that even, but there are not that many. But uh, you know, because of karma, uh, people die young. They have uh, diseases and uh, other things like uh, that. But you know, but people fear, you know, aging and death. So they're not living in accordance with reality. I think I mentioned already uh, this yesterday. You know, when people start showing signs of old age where they want to cover it up, you know, dyeing their hair, getting, uh, removing their wrinkles or uh, so many things like that. Because it's... Uh, you know, it's not uh, popular in this culture. or and, and then when people get older also, they, you know, they put them into old age homes and, and, and things like that where they kind of keep them out of sight because it's a reminder for everyone else that that's going to happen to them too. And this illusion of beauty, the illusion of youth is propagated, of course, in commercials and entertainment and everything. Uh, at least I'm, I'm kind of generalizing, but uh, I mean, you know, a doctor tries to save a life, and then if they can't save it, the people might blame the doctor. Because death is going to happen. Uh, and but people want to prolong their life even for two or three days longer. Uh, from the Dhamma point of view, that's, that's not that's not seen as something useful. Uh, 
It's useful to prepare your mind for death when you're still healthy and not wait until, you know, the last minute, two or three days before you die to think you're going to calm your mind and, uh, you know, somehow, uh, you know, overcome all of your negative habits that are going to affect you in the next uh, life. Uh, such as, you know, holding grudges, not having forgiven people, having lots of hatred or greed. If you die with all that in your mind, that means, uh, you know, that energy is not just going to go poof in in the smoke and disappear. Uh, Because his mental energy is a very strong energy. It's too bad Western science knows nothing about it. But uh, anyway, uh, so... You know, death is something that shouldn't be uh, seen as something uh, unusual or to be uh, feared because it's just the flip side of birth. It's like two sides of a coin. If you're born, you're going to die. And if you die without enlightenment, you'll be born again. So, uh, so actually the And now, according to the Dhamma, actually there's a saying, as we said, uh, the mindful do not die in this Dhammapada verse of the Buddha. The mindful do not die. How is that? And the unmindful are as if dead already. So we we mentioned that already. Uh, It's kind of just, uh, you know, when mindful is of dead already, that means they're not actually physically dead, but uh, you know they're they're doing things that could cause them death at any time. And also, what means are, the unmindful are dead already is that they're dead to the inner life. They're dead. They're dead to the uh, the real life of the life force. That means they're dead to the present moment awareness, which is life force. because they're just caught up in their greed, hatred, and deluded uh, thoughts, and just I, me, and mine type of thoughts, and all their uh, emotions. So they're dead to the subtler joy and happiness of present moment awareness. That's you know, more to the point. That there's this, the, the experience of present moment awareness, which is the natural condition of the mind and which is the underlying Dhamma, the pure Dhamma, the state of the deathless. Uh, that that state is, you know, a state beyond birth and death. It was never born and it never dies, but it is, the you could say, the essence of all uh, life, the essence of uh, consciousness. <clears throat> so it's this uh, living and dying with uh, awareness is, you know, in our practice of Dhamma, that's what ultimately we are, you know, working toward understanding is the stream of present moment deathless awareness that's there underlying all of the the five aggregates and then the uh, mental process that's going on in the flow of impermanence. So, and knowing how to live in that, that's where, you know, the whole Dhamma is about, uh, you know, understanding that and then training one's mind to be able to directly experience it because most people it's just a kind of a you know a fairy tale or some you know something you can't even imagine but actually it's literally just beneath your nose i mean it is really that simple it's almost as simple as just flipping a tv channel in the old days our mind because the conditioning is simply locked on to what I euphemistically call channel E, 
earth plane. Yeah, earth plane consciousness. That's all we know about the world. It's just this earth plane consciousness, what we can see and experience through the six senses and the condition. But, uh, you know, the people who master their mind, such as the Buddha or so many others too, through concentration and through attaining stages of liberation, but especially with like, you know, meditation practice concentration, you can flip the switch. Not immediately maybe, but it's a training where you can, you know, flip the switch to another channel. And because we understand the mind, the Buddha and people like that, they can master the mind uh, to uh, you know, a great degree to be able to do that. Now, unfortunately, modern science really knows nothing about it. It's a, it's a shame, really, because you know, they call themselves scientists. I mean, what's a scientist supposed to be about? They're supposed to have an open mind and about discovering new things, but they don't even want to look at the mind. Okay, right now, maybe they're starting to a little bit, but uh, that's only because of the popularity of Buddhism and, and yoga and things like that in the last 50, 60 years. And, and you know, certain yogis displaying psychic powers and how oh, now they're getting kind of interested. But they're not interested in a real way, so they'll never give it the time to actually develop the power of them of themselves. Anyway, I don't want to get into too much in that argument, but you know, it is a kind of a, a shame that uh, the mind is given short shrift over the material world. So, at the expense of the material world, in damaging the earth by greed to exploit, you know, the earth and all the things you already know about, uh, and then causing some of that to also then affect our bodies in a in negative way, and also uh, affecting people's uh, minds at the expense of people's minds because they get dominated by greed for more and more luxury, more and more things are not satisfied. They always want more and more. Uh, so at the expense of the material world, they're even damaging uh, their mind because uh, they don't know it. Uh, but that's where the Dhamma is sort of the opposite. And that's why countries in the East, like India, for example, which is a very ancient culture, you know, they never bothered <laughs> really developing modernity until only the British came. And then even more so just, you know, 50, 60 years ago, because of their, uh, you know, uh, you know, that Eastern sort of uh, viewpoint of life. It wasn't seen as uh, that uh, big of a deal. They were, the spiritual life was more important. Now, of course, that's changed. But uh, anyway, I'm just uh, saying this, try to just uh, to give a, a picture of what's uh, sort of going on in terms of this understanding the nature of uh, living and dying with uh, awareness. So awareness, of course, means mindfulness. And mindfulness is the path to the deathless. That means when we practice mindfulness, basically it means moment to moment awareness. It means you're training yourself to be uh, alert to what you're doing. So like knowing what your body is doing at all times. From moment to moment, if you change your posture from walking to standing, you know that. Or from standing to walking or from sitting to standing or laying down. Or like in these yoga exercises we do, all the yoga exercises, you're, you're totally focused and, and you know, on the movements and feeling the sensations. So you are, you know, in that way, you're tuning in to the present moment awareness. 
And being grounded in the body is the doorway for discovering the mind and the mental process. When we call, when we say mind, actually it's a mental process. And for those of you who are familiar with the five aggregates, you know, the five aggregates, I mean, there's the whole body, mind, and everything in the universe can be uh, categorized in one of the five aggregates. But four of them are considered mental, and only one is the material aggregate. So the others are feelings, uh, thoughts and emotions, and uh, habits and so on and uh, uh, well, uh, perceptions, there's feeling, perceptions, and volitional activities, which are the uh, thoughts and, and habits and the accumulated karmic habits that we've been uh, uh, accumulating. And then consciousness. So consciousness is, is in a special class by itself. Even though it's one of the four aggregates, it has a, a separate kind of place. It's uh, so normally it's called uh, the mind is normally considered feeling, perception, and volition. Uh, consciousness is also the main part of the mind, but because it's a special class in itself, it's uh, it's uh, often mentioned by itself. Uh, and the five aggregates are what uh, occupy one of the most important places in the Buddhist teaching. And, uh, and so many of the like the sutta studies I've been giving in the evenings and other times, five aggregates has featured uh, prominently in uh, in those teachings by the Buddha. In fact, just if you were listening last week, Wednesday, to the sutta class, you know that was a, a question that an ascetic had. He said he, one of the disciples of the Buddha was there and he says, you know, what is your teacher, Master Gautama? What, what, what is, how does he discipline his disciples? And what, what are, what kind of ins meditation instructions he, he given to his disciples? And his answer was, form is impermanent, feeling is impermanent, perceptions are impermanent, volitional formations are impermanent, consciousness is impermanent. Form is not self, feelings are not self, volitions are not self, consciousness is not self. That's how he trains and disciplines it is. He didn't say anything else. But observing five precepts or about practicing generosity or needful, but that's, that's the essence. Uh, so anyway, sorry if I get a little excited. <laughs> but, uh, Very relevant. Unfortunately, it's, it's misunderstood by a lot of uh, people. But, so anyway, uh, so, but that's the mental process. And that is the real life. Because the only way we experience the world is we, we become conscious. When you go to sleep at night and you're no longer conscious, you might be having a dream, but, but basically this world doesn't exist for you for five or six or seven hours. Uh, until you wake up in the morning, wow, you know, wow, it was a dream. You know, it, was, it was all in your mind. <clears throat> so, and even basically while we're living, an ignorant person basically is living in their mind. We say we live on this physical earth. No, people live in their mind from the, from the deepest Dhamma understanding. Your feet might be walking on this earth, but basically the way your mind is experiencing the world is a mental movie projector. Your mind is basically just a mental movie projector and your eyes are the screen, uh, so to speak. Because even I think ophthalmologists would say that, you know, you're seeing what you see is the inside of your eye and the images and so on. Maybe I'm wrong on <laughs> eye doctrine, but anyway, so understanding the mental process is really the, the living process. 
So in the mindfulness, uh, because the body is always in the present moment, that's why it's taken as the entryway for uh, being able to see the how the, the mind is impermanent, or the real birth and death. So we mentioned there's two levels of birth and death, external birth and death, and internal birth and death, or what we call momentary birth and death. And that means normally what we call the mind, now, okay, you're looking around and you see all these different things, but it seems like a just a, a smooth flowing uh, picture. Is it? Huh? You, you know, you look around here, and all these things appear to be standing out in time and space. In real, if you go touch them, oh yes. You know. uh, but actually, what is occurring from the metaphysical uh, standpoint? and the, the mental standpoint is that it's like frames of a movie and uh, our consciousness, I mean, the underlying nature of, of uh, consciousness is that it's made up of frames of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking, which are like individual frames of a camera or a, a movie reel, the old fashioned movie reels that are, you know, just one frame with a little hole in it followed by another one. And then when they run the movie reel through a projector, you don't see those spaces between the, because it's going quickly. And also the light is what projects that film onto a screen. And so a very, in a very similar way, that's how this mind, the conditioned mind is, uh, you know, perceiving the world, how we experience the world, although we think it's outside of ourself. And we're not saying it outside doesn't exist, but the way we're perceiving it is conditioned by our, uh, our, uh, you know, by the past comma, and by you know where we are born, and so on, and how we're trained. Because you know, if people's organs are damaged, they don't perceive things in the same way. You know, they can't hear, they can't see, and their, their life is totally kind of. And different. <clears throat> so anyway, these what are called mind moments, moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking. Uh, but each of them arises and vanishes very quickly. You know, just, in fact, they don't even exist from a, a deeper physical, physics standpoint. They arise and vanish so quickly the way the nervous system is processing information. Uh, now, how many of you have seen a graph? You know, you've seen graphs or even on the, on the audio, if you ever edit audio files, you know, you see for every slight little fluctuation of sound, there's a different thing, right? And even if I, you know, if you saw just that little bit on a graph, you know, you could stretch it out quite long. And each of those is a separate arising and vanishing. Uh, of course, we don't see that because our mind is dull and our mind is very, in a very slow rate of perception because of its attachment and clinging. Uh, it doesn't allow you to see how quickly the mind is operating. And this is important because it's, it's the basis of how illusion arises. Because we don't see how the mind is really operating. We get uh, 
deluded or things appear to be elusive. Or we, we you know, take them the wrong way. And we, we form attachments uh, to them. So anyway, turning into the flow of impermanence, that's what I talked about this morning, is the way in which we gradually uh, can enter the flow of present moment uh, awareness by not getting caught or stuck on any particular sensation. And things exist only with the amount of attention we're giving them. So we allow our mind to stick on an object and then thinking about it, then it drags in the past and future connected with the object and it triggers off our emotions of like, dislike, jealousy, envy, whatever. Uh, and also we're identifying with that as belonging to me or myself. These are my experiences. And this is my past. And this is what I'm going to do in the future. So all of that is created in the mind. In the mind, by the mind, for the mind. Uh, and each person lives in their own mind. No one can experience what you're experiencing except for maybe somebody with ESP or maybe the Buddha. But uh, basically, everyone is born alone and they'll die alone in terms of the mind. You might have a friend and live together, but they cannot experience your deepest emotions and feelings. Or they might talk to you about it and say, oh, well, okay, but and you might have sympathy for them, but still you, you cannot experience another person's kind of direct feelings and thoughts. <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, you know, in the meditation practice uh, is uh, especially in the mindfulness and the vipassana meditation. Actually, you know, vipassana meditation, the word vipassana uh, means you know seeing reality as it is. And how is it? It's impermanent, as I was just explaining. Uh, that everything is in a constant state of flux and change. And this is not something strange to science. Even physics knows this, but they just pay lip service to it. They don't apply it in a real sense to the human being. They try to separate the human being from the physical world. Uh, or they don't, don't apply it to, to their mind to get the, the maximum benefit out of their scientific uh, knowledge, only for the material level for the most part. Sure, maybe making medicines and stuff like that, that's great too, but uh, you know, the greatest medicine being meditation, they know nothing about. And so, I hope none of you are listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, I'm just, you know, I'm speaking in a kind of a general way, but. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so anyway. Um, so in, you know, tuning into that, of course, first you have to be, have to reach a level of concentration. But then it's, a, that's why I, I, you know, I've mentioned many times, once you've gotten the mind centered and, and focused, then deliberately pay attention to how quickly different things are coming and going. That's why you have to let go of the concentration object and let it be there in the background, but no longer uh, having to focus on that. Actually, that's the meaning of concentration. You use the breathing to help you get concentrated. That means because there's so many distractions going around. So we have to hold on to it like we're in a windstorm, right? Anchor. Yeah, like the anchor of a ship. But when it dies down, so when the storm dies down, the ship doesn't need an anchor anymore, does it? 
If it's sitting in a bay that's perfectly placid, it doesn't have to have an anchor because it's not moving around very much. It's only the waves and the storms that make it move around. So that's why we, because our mind is stormy in the beginning with the five aggregates, those are the waves and storms, and the impermanence and so on, and the, the hindrances, excuse me, hindrances and fetters. So we use a concentration object, it's just the breathing, uh, until it calms down. But once it's calmed down, you don't need to focus on it anymore because it's always there in the back of your mind without trying. Uh, and so therefore you can look at other things, but the mind will still be calm, will still be concentrated. And that's the, the function you know, the practical function and purpose of the meditation is to hold the mind steady so that one can uh, contemplate impermanence, but without being disturbed by the things that it's feeling and observing. So, and then you start feeling the sensations. So, all the, the material aggregate, the sensations, and seeing how quickly they come and go. So you deliberately, by having whole body awareness that I already mentioned I think, this morning, when you're able to kind of keep that feeling of the outline of the body there in the in the, the eye and kind of seeing the periphery of something, you know, uh, something is stinging on your toe, you'll be able to immediately notice that. And at the same time, as you know, maybe an ant is biting on your ear. Now, how many people have ever had that happen where you had some insects biting different parts of your body at the same time, maybe out, out in the forest or something, you know, that are causing pain? So you're able to feel those, right? So why can't you do that in meditation? Uh, a lot of people say, well, when I try to look at so many things, I get confused and overwhelmed. Well, that's because you don't have concentration. So, uh, you know, and that's why initially you, you need to have some degree of concentration, not to the point of the fourth jhana or anything like that, but it, it, just so that the hindrances are weakened, even 50% is probably good enough when you're no longer constantly nodding out or no longer constantly lost in your thoughts, when there's more space and, uh, in between, then you can... Uh, start in between those hindrances. You, you catch a couple of sensations, you know, sensation here, ping here, ping here. And you, know, and you, you, you let it build up momentum. And usually starting on the body is, is the easiest because it's so immediate and there's so many sensations. And if you get stuck on one sensation, you don't have to get stuck on one sensation. Feel something else. There's always hundreds of sensations, if not thousands or millions available that you could feel in the body if your mind was really, really concentrated. Uh, but again, you have to gradually kind of get into it. It's like gradually wading into the ocean. You know, you put a foot in and then you gradually getting immersed into it. Can you please elaborate a little bit about um, what you mentioned about momentum? Can you just please um, explain a little bit on that? Momentum of what? Well, you, you kept saying you build momentum. Momentum, that means you're able to notice more and more things in a shorter space of time. The momentum of uh, noticing. So you start with the breathing, right? So you feel the sensations of breathing in. And even in one in-breath, there's many sensations, not just one, especially if you're concentrating on the expanding and contracting of the abdomen. That's why this is more suitable for this kind of meditation. Because you can see in, in, in a one or two second breath, you should be able to see at least four or five or six different sensations. 
And what I heard was like, don't get hung up on one sensation because one is powerful, but just leave it, focus on something else right away also. So. Well, that one sensation actually is just you know, vanishing. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't even last, but it appears to be last, but that's, it appears to last, but that's because our concentration isn't clear enough. So anyway, building up momentum is, for example, you know, uh, when you start the meditation or after you've gotten focused, you know, train yourself. That's why I do this body scanning. You know, how quickly can you just, you know, move your attention to feel your toe? And just, and then immediately after feeling it for just half a second, you know, feel your ear. And a half a second, feel this ear. And feel this arm. And feel that arm. Feel this side, that side. Keep it moving so the mind doesn't have time to, you know, clean because, you know, it's moving. And you can do that. Some people say, well, that's not concentration. But no, it's not. Because Vipassana is not concentration. So uh, anyway, I don't want to get into that <laughs> argument. But uh, <clears throat> so in the beginning, you, you kind of deliberately do it maybe because we have to, it's a training, right? You're not used to that. So anything that you're not used to doing, it takes some effort. Uh, but later when you're able to hold that outline of the body, they'll just naturally appear just like looking into a mirror. You know, you can see things happening on the periphery without actually having to turn your head and look, right? You may not see clear details of it, but still, you know, something is coming in and going. And if you want to look at it and see the details, it's very easy. Uh, because the nature of the mind is like that, but we've never had that experience because we've never uh, trained ourselves. So anyway, that's building up momentum. So you, you feel the in-breath arises and vanishes. The out-breath arises and vanishes. And then while you're holding in the breath for a moment, you can feel you know, some other sensation, you know, some other things, you know, a couple of, you know, that arose and vanish, even in the space of holding your breath in for one second. And you let the breath out. Even while you're letting the breath out, you can feel many things. You can actually observe many things happening at one time. It's because the mind is not uh, trying to identify them. You're not using a lot of mental energy trying to decipher what is that and, and this and that. It's just uh, like points of light, you know, George Bush's thousand points of light, right? For those who remember that. <laughs> no. Or fireflies, that's actually a very nice, I, I like that example. That's why I like to sit out in the summertime at dusk and when the fireflies start coming. Because that's, that's actually these momentary, mind moments of consciousness, just. How many have seen fireflies at dusk? You know, and you don't have to look for them. You know, you just like this and, you know, you're, you can see so many lights just outside the periphery, you know, just hundreds and thousands. It's exactly what happens when your mind is focused on the flow of the impermanence. So, and then once you can see that with the body sensations, at the same time, there's sounds coming in and out. Depending on when you're, where you are, it could be a lot of sounds or not too many. Sounds even inside your body sounds right around you, sounds from outside. You'd be amazed at how many things you can. And they're zipping in between uh, all these body sensations. But see, your mind is in a relaxed mode and it's not trying to grasp or cling it any. That's why we can see more. Because if you start reacting to things, you, you block, you slow down that rate of perception because you're having to invest more energy figuring out, what's that pain in my knee? Oh, I'm gonna get crippled, blah, 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 blah. You know? So you have to have the skill to interrupt all of that. And so this training in Vipassana is a deliberate 
training in the beginning. That's why that Mahasi technique is a very good technique for training in that one, uh, where you just note each moment of even the body movement, you know, lifting is one movement, stretching out is another movement, open your hand, another movement, closing the hands, another movement, bringing it back, putting it down, turning this way, turning up. Each one is arising and vanishing. So that's what you're training in your mind. You're tuning into just arising and vanishing. <clears throat> and then even thoughts are darting up in between sensations. You see this urge to want to move, the urge to think or uh, but because you don't cling on to it, it vanishes and there's, and you pay attention to something else. So you just forget about what you might have wanted to think about before. That's what's beautiful. People are lost in their thoughts. Why am I lost in my thoughts? Because you're allowing yourself to get stuck on the thoughts. Instead, feel something in your toe. If you're lost in your thoughts, you know, feel some prominent sensations in the body. When you're lost in the body, listen to sounds. You keep it moving. You don't give the mind a chance to latch on to any particular uh, one. And when you're able to do that, the reality starts to stretch, to stretch out. That means the mind expands and you're able to see so many uh, things. It, you know, arising and vanishing, but you're not bringing in the past and the history of those objects or projecting them into the future or even clinging on to them in the present. Uh, because, you know, you're, you're in that flow, you've entered the flow, what's called entering the flow of impermanence. Uh, and usually, of course, in meditation, the three most... Uh, prominent sensations are, of course, physical sensations and sounds and then the thoughts. So it's not too many smells, tastes, or uh, sights, you know, if you're sitting with your eyes closed and so on. So, so primarily, the, most of our body sensations, sounds, again, depending on where you are, and then thoughts and urges and ideas and uh, so on. But you might see mental images too. Uh, and so as you build up momentum, there's not enough time for the mind to create its mental, its mental picture. And that's why then the, the reality, the, 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 there's a paradigm shift within consciousness. There's kind of a break from the, the conditioned consciousness. And also from the I-centered consciousness, because the I, the ego, the feeling of I, me, or mine exists in direct proportion to how much attachment or identification you're giving to any particular sense stimulation. The ego is actually a resistance to what is. A resistance of either desire to, to have it or the desire to push it away. Uh, and, and that's what creates and uh, continues the, the thought of I am. But when there's no longer this grasping, clinging, identifying, reacting to pleasure and pain, the sense of I has nothing to do because it was never anything real in the first place. As we saw with the baby, it was created because of the condition. And it starts to melt away. Uh, just like an ice cube melting into water. I like that example very nicely. If you have a lot of ice cubes in a bowl of water, or a bowl of punch, right? Hot summer day, right? Ice punch, ice tea. So when you got a lot of ice cubes in the water, and you, you know, they're all jiggling and making noise, right? Because they're hitting into each other. So egos are what make noise, bumping into something else or bumping into some object. Oh, pain in my knee, oh, mine is all, you know. 
is because it's bumping into the pain with attachment. That pain is in my knee. Or this body, and this body is mine. I'm, I'm Joe so-and-so. All that is what creates the suffering. So anyway, what happens when the ice cubes melt? Now the ice cubes are also water, right? But you think that the ice cubes are separate from water. That's only because they're solidified. So when the ego is solidified into me, then it seems to be different than consciousness. But when it melts, it's no longer different from consciousness. It's not a part of consciousness anymore. It becomes awareness. So consciousness is like the ice cube within awareness. That means the individual consciousness that's clinging on to an object and that has the sense of I with it. You see, so it's very interesting to, to uh, contemplate that. And especially when you actually experience it. So, uh, so that image of the ice cube. So when the ice cube melts, it, it becomes water. And the water, you could say, would be the awareness. And water, when it's not moving, it reflects everything that comes uh, across it. And that's the, the, real, the nature of awareness, the present moment awareness, which is the natural condition of, of, of what we call our mind or consciousness. And that is really the, you know, the uh, uh, life when, it, when one is, uh, you know, floating with the wave of impermanence, then you're able to experience so much more. Life is so much more uh, uh, alive. When you're sitting there and you can feel the whole body, you know, hundreds if not thousands of sensations just occurring, you know, just all the time. And then throw into that hundreds and sounds coming and going. It's a symphony, life symphony, but natural. And even your own thoughts that come up, they can't hurt you as long as you don't cling to it and identify it. And so that is, you know, that is the real living. That is the real living process. Now, of course, if you want to, you can interrupt that and do something that's needful. But when you don't have to, you can learn how to just rest and come back into it. Uh, so you can learn how to, that's what the Buddha was a master of. The relative world, the conventional truth, and then absolute truth. When something needed to be done in conventional truth, like go give a lecture to some people, he could, you know, act as if, or his mind could act in relative terms. But when there was no need to do anything special, just like easier than flipping a switch, he could just come back and rest in this uh, life stream. Uh, so, anyway, so that, you know, living and dying with awareness or living with awareness means being grounded and, and being aware of all the things that are passing through the nervous system, maybe not all of them, but at least, you know, be aware of what is coming through and then learning to be careful of what you react to and to let go of what is superfluous, which is quite a lot <laughs> once you really start to understand it. Uh, so you can also live a much simpler life and you don't have to you know, surround your life with so many things that then bring their own different types of problems and so on. But, uh, and then there's also the, the no fear of death. Because death is only for what is born. If you enter the timeless, deathless awareness, which is the flow of the present moment, and if you're able to die in that state, 
or if you've trained yourself, there's no death. Like the Buddha didn't die. Enlightened people, there's totally different words used for the Buddha or an arahant. You don't say they died. There's a special word given for them. Uh, yeah, but it's in Sinhalese, it's even different than that. Uh, uh, Apawatuna is the word they give for a monk who's died, Apawatuna. Uh, but anyway, so uh, the, you know, people who enter that stream of life, they've already died, basically. That means they've died to their ego and all the defilements of, of, of the mind. And so death for them is, is nothing important. Uh, but death for an ordinary person is like taking off one set of clothes and going in and by getting and putting on another set of clothes and come out in a different costume. Uh, but uh, death for a, uh, an arahant, uh, so there's two types of death. They've already died before the physical body died. That means they died to the delusions and especially the ego consciousness. Um, so, you know, that is sort of the, the main meaning of that statement about them. The, the mindful do not die because they've already uh, Die. Their physical body might die, but that's not true death in the Dhamma language. True death in the Dhamma language is death of the ignorance and of the ego consciousness. Uh, so <clears throat> that is, uh, you know, that is how, you know, as meditators, we uh, and w once you start to appreciate that, and once you practice, you know, meditation, and start to get some sense of that, uh, then you will, you know, you will start to appreciate appreciating that more and more, and of, of the, uh, you know, the benefits that come with living more grounded in the present moment, rather than just always just so reactive and letting yourself getting carried away in your emotions and and other types of things which, you know, you don't really have to do if you don't want to, if you, if you know how, if you know how to train uh, uh, the mind. And, you know, all of the Noble Eightfold Path is the way that you train yourself in working towards this uh, reality of, uh, you know, or, or the, to reach the end of suffering. And uh, I'll be talking more about that in uh, tomorrow's, uh, the closing talk tomorrow uh, about that. So I think this might be enough for uh, this talk. And if, again, if you have any questions about any of those things, then you can write them down for this evening's class. And uh, if any of you out there in the virtual world uh, will have a question, you can write it down on the chat uh, box tonight. Yeah. And uh, then we'll try to get to those too. I was joking. <laughs> Your COVID germs coming. <laughs> okay, well, I'm also sorry about it. I hope that this big group of people that came this morning was kind of unexpected. And yeah, I wasn't even expecting a big group like that, but I'm hoping, hope that, you know, some of you might have been worried about all these barrage of people kind of coming in out of nowhere and, you know, crowding around. But at least they were, they were all wearing masks and so on, at least most of the time. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, 
stand up, take a short little break if you need to use the restroom or come back to a standing awareness for a while and a few stretches and then have our next sitting. Out there in virtual land, we'll be coming back if you want to and uh, so I can hang on for a few minutes. The balls of the feet, the toes. And just kind of have that idea of a scientist looking down to the microscope, focus in on his different body parts. And feel the straight legs over the feet. Feel where the clothing touches the skin on different places. In this exercise, it's actually what I was talking about, the ability to feel, you know, several different sensations in those, in those areas, rather than just one. And moving up the legs to feel the whole pelvic and groin area between the hips, including the buttocks. Kind of just scan that area with the attention. Should be able to notice many different little sensations. Don't get stuck on any one, just see how many different ones you can notice. Don't try to label them or identify them. It's just life force sensation. Be able to switch like from the right side to the left side. Both sides together. You now feel your hands and fingers. See if you can notice each thumb and each finger, you should be able to kind of Feel the sensation, the outline of each finger, thumb. Feel some sensation in each one. Especially be alert how certain ones just arise and vanish very clearly. Like a pulse. You now feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. like a large salami hanging in the butcher shop. Just try to feel different sensations in 
your bicep down to the elbow or lower arm. Left side, the right side. Also, let it feel where the clothing rubs the skin on the outside. There's two worlds, the outer world, the inner world. The world outside the skin, the world inside, under the skin. You now let's let the awareness kind of go into the center of the body and feel the stomach and chest area, the skin, the clothing touching the skin, and the stomach and chest, or any other sensations, the stomach pain or chest pain. Heartbeat. Even while you're feeling, focusing on these body areas so sounds can be heard coming and going in the background even each syllable of this voice is a separate arising and vanishing Now move the attention up to feel your neck, your outer neck. And inside the throat. Neck and throat is the super highway that connects the head to the lower body. Lots of traffic, blood, electrical impulses, food, liquid. Air. Just moving the awareness up into the to the jaws, the lower jaw. 
where it connects underneath the ear to the skull, and juts out to the chin, embedded with teeth and gums. If you can even visualize it, that adds an extra dimension. And feel the tongue laying in the mouth, the moist saliva. All these sensations are different. That's how we can recognize them. through memory. Feel the lips touching together. And feel the nose, the outer nose. And take a few deeper breaths to try to feel or even hear the sound moving through the nostrils. Now feel the eyes and eyelids. Now feel the ears, the outer ears. And inside the ear canal. Listen very closely. You may hear the inner sound vibration.
and brain activity, alpha waves. From that point, just let the awareness expand a bit to feel the outline of the standing body. Establish whole body awareness. The feet pressing the floor underneath, the arms and hands at the side. Clothing touching the skin on different places. The head on top. And just sort of contemplate that reality. What you call the body is just the conglomeration of all these different sensations. Feeding into the brain to create the idea of a standing body. It's created in the mind through memory and sensation. And then there's the thought of, this is my body, which is also created by the conditioned mind. In reality, it's just amorphous vibrations floating through mental space. present moment awareness. Just open up to that flow of impermanence. So many sensations just arising and vanishing, coming and going all over the place. The mind trying to hold on to some There's always something else to notice. The mirror mind. The mind is a reflective mirror. When it's resting in the present moment, you don't have to look for anything. It appears by itself. To 
different sensations, sounds, thoughts, urges. You can continue to stand longer if you like, otherwise, if you, whenever ready, just without breaking your awareness, just very mindfully, slowly sit back down without breaking the flow of awareness. And continue in the sitting posture. Sensations of the in-breath come and go. Feeling of your fingers come and go. Sensations of the out-breath come and go. Prickling sensation comes and goes. Perception comes and goes. Or a thought. And you don't have to look, they come to you. They come through the awareness. Just be relaxed, awake, alert.
turning up the power of the mental microscope to notice more and more and subtler sensations, vibrations. Rising and vanishing, rising and vanishing. Rising and vanishing.
From time to time, take a few deep, slow breaths, recenter. Recharge the bloodstream with oxygen. Activate awareness. You can identify the five aggregates as they arise. Understanding this is material form, this is feeling, this is perception, habit formation, eye consciousness. Try to understand how the mind creates its picture or idea of our life through this flow of impermanence, constantly changing. Picks and chooses what it wants to cling and attach to leaves the rest. That's Vipassana.
you have a good awareness of the flow of impermanence, You feel like body and mind being an empty house with nobody home to answer the knocking on the doors and windows. But there's a sensitive microphone a silent seeing eye camera in the house that knows but doesn't know, cannot do anything. Just allowing the hard edges of the body outlined and just gradually melt away or dissolve. There's no longer even a so called body. Sensations, vibrations, coming and going. Present moment awareness, space of awareness. And the last traces of I, me, your mind. Nothing to hold on to. Just allowing the last bit of ice of the ego become the water. Awareness.
So continue to sit longer if you have good concentration and awareness. Just continue with the practice, sitting or standing or walking for the next hour until the yoga period. I'm going to be available uh, shortly if anybody would like to have a private interview about the meditation practice. It'll be in the, the kitchen there. You can come in. Um,